can't believe you know. Um, I once did. I once did tell Rick Levin that uh, the yellow education is great, but I didn't say you're the yellow education is great. It's the best place in the world to get an education in the media of the 19th century. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I wanted. I wanted to go quick. I believe in minimal viable products. So this is kind of a minimal viable presentation. <laughs> um, but what I wanted to do was uh, try to capture some old guy wisdom for free. And I hope uh, for you it elicits uh, uh, some interactivity. Um, I've done a lot of, I've done some in college, done a lot of note giving and products. And my experience is that it's the best of sessions. Uh, people can take away one and a half ideas. And here's what it means to take away an idea. It means that you can figure out how to take action on it in the next week. So one and a half ideas. So your goal is one and a half ideas from um, this next bit of time. And my experience is the only people who ever take away more than one and a half ideas are people who take notes or who uh, check the blog later. So if you're ambitious, if, you know, if you're a lifelong learner who likes to get more than one and a half things per 45 minutes, um, either take notes or sit next to someone who is that kind of person. Um, this is some of the stuff I've done. You know, it's kind of uh, games and companies and brands. Um, any questions? You know, I'm kind of, some, some of you have seen, some of you haven't. But it's, um, you know, the, I did the, um, uh, some of the early math in John Madden football, and I use it to tell educators that uh, video games are a great way to teach math. Um, and, you know, other stuff. So the, uh, in, in general, as you're managing yourself or you're managing other people, you know, you can think about what's your career bucket list. In games, um, uh, console video games take about two years to build. And now in mobile, mobile games take about a year. So if you're a creator, if you're in the business of doing one thing a year, and you've got 40 years of work life ahead, it means you only got 40 things to do. Uh, so if you start uh, imagining that each is one of 40, you might try a little harder. And for those of you who have, more, who have fewer than 40 years to go, you know, um, go each each uh, each try is uh, uh, a little more precious. So my day, day job, as said, I'm kind of a venture capitalist now for six years. We invented this thing called Product Works at Kleiner Perkins. I'm the chief product officer. And what that means is I touch 15 of our portfolio companies per month, usually in about 90 minute product sessions, starting with an audit. And for those of you who don't know what we consider product management, it used to be people management and kind of the glue, which by the way, you know, people are great at. And now it's very much uh, uh, quant, because all this tech stuff is always connected to servers, and um, everything can be instrumented. And there's kind of a tendency for quants to believe, uh, believe the data from the server more than they believe uh, real people. So good thing about Yale is, is they tend to be very people-oriented. Uh, the residential college system gives lifelong benefits that um, uh, those in tech industries are just starting to appreciate. I'm on seven boards and um, um, we keep investing. So in the last three and a half months, um, co-invested along with an investing partner in four companies, Duolingo, which is a leading language learning app that's free, that's business model is uh, selling translations at three cents a word that are done by the uh, advanced students. Secret, which is uh, anonymous secret sharing, uh, mostly true at kind of starting to uh, uh, break tech news, like the Google Plus dude leaving an advance showed up on Secret ahead of uh, TechCrunch. Uh, BetterWorks, which is okay, our objective and key result, creation and cascading through enterprise. Um, I'm a big believer in setting goals and then being transparent about what they are. And um, Mango Health, which is a uh, prescription medicine adherence app created by a game guy. Okay, so um, since we're at Yale, I want to talk about how to be educated. Um, in my experience, I've not met a single uh, college president or high school president who has a working definition of uh, educated. 
you know, they, they mean educated is you got the degree that I offer, so you're accredited. Um, here's my definition of educated, and, and I think definitions should uh, stand the test of uh, machine readability. And why, you know, because I'm an English major who thinks like a geek. Um, so to be educated in college or in grad school or in life, you have to have completed three projects. I'm a big fan of learning by doing. Um, John Dewey was the original educator of Learn By Doing, and I actually think that's the joy of uh, technology-based manipulatives, is you can learn by doing in a scalable way without breaking the stuff. Uh, I think understanding data is really important, and that is, uh, it's not just number data, it's you know scientific data, what is clean data? All scientists know that, uh, 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 that capturing clean data is really hard. And uh, all salespeople know that the secret to sales is to ignore the outliers. You know, make the case you want and then use the, the numbers to prove your case and ignore the outliers. Um, and then understand rhetoric. Um, most people in business can't differentiate between data and rhetoric. Uh, so it's pretty important. You know, rhetoric is, um, t it's not the intrinsic, the extrinsic um, aspects that make something less and more believable. It turns out rhyme and alliteration make the same statement seem somewhere between two and three times as believable as measured by people. Uh, I once had a professor who said his lesson in life is if you have a bad lecture, wear a suit. So the suit's the rhetoric and the lecture is the data. And then, um, um, there's a guy named uh, Franz Johansson at Stanford who wrote a book called The Medici Effect, and he asserts and thinks he can prove that creativity happens at the intersection of two domains. Um, it's where the most valuable patents happen, and he also asserts that the most valuable patents are created by the people who create the most patents. So in general, in creativity, I'm a fan of iteration and doing a lot rather than waiting to do just one good thing. By the way, the same thing is true of entrepreneurship. Um, never entrepreneur because you expect your, because you're planning on your first thing to succeed. Entrepreneur because you want to fail for a long time and have fun at it. Or entrepreneur because you can't work for a boss. That's, the only, that's actually the only really legit reason entrepreneur is that you are unmanageable and you're just, <laughs> and you're sick of being unmanageable. So expert in two domains, it's a little like language learning. All Europeans know that once they know two languages, um, they can be more, um, more malleable in their thinking. You know, they can kind of imagine from multiple points of view. Um, you know, Americans tend not to do that. Um, so think Americans, expert in two domains is like basketball and football. Okay, um, uh, building your toolkit in general, um, you know, your job in your career and in life is to constantly improve your toolkit. Uh, your portfolio is not just for art. I actually think um, uh, resumes are, they're kind of a Rorschach test of how you think about yourself, but they're not very valuable. They mostly unsell you rather than sell you. Um, so always be thinking about what is your portfolio. It's stuff you're doing at work, stuff you do at school. In school, and in business school, and in graduate school, your job is to create three, the three projects. Always have three great portfolio things. Um, I have a concept called a minimum viable business plan that's on kpcb.com. Um, so I think in everything you do, it's worth having uh, uh, what English teachers would call an outline. I call it a minimum viable business plan. It's four slides. The first slide is the movie poster. That's your vision, which is someday, if all goes well, customers like these are going to be using my thing like these and every, everything that's going to change the world. Uh, the second is your five good ideas. The third is your five best assets. And the fourth is numbers. That's uh, design thinking for those of you who, who uh, follow David and Tom Kelly. And IDEO, design thinking, again, is looking for latent needs with cameras and video cameras. Um, in consumers' places of power, not in your office. And, um, and then iterating with increasingly high resolution prototypes. It's, I think it's probably the, the most important um, creative manipulative there is. By the way, in education, I'm a strong fan of learning by doing with manipulatives. Uh, the way to teach science is to start with gardening. Uh, the way to teach uh, um, 
drama in English is to uh, start with telling stories. Uh, the way to teach movies is to start with sitting around a Jewish or Italian table and trying to get your story in while somebody else is talking. <laughs> um, and um, Nueva School in Hillsborough is a school that has this kind of um, a curriculum map with new manipulatives entered all the way. The ultimate in, uh, in math, it's a graphic calculator for middle schoolers. Uh, Yale's not very good at manipulatives, so for, uh, um, for the humanities, a manipulative is Microsoft Word and uh, search engine. You know, basically you have to, you know, I'm not a fan of textbooks. Um, and then writing and presenting, um, you know, most kids at Yale don't fear presenting it's because they kind of trust that they have friends who want to diss them too bad. Um, but uh, facility and writing presenting is really important. Okay, um, I like to talk to people, many of whom are younger than you, about uh, you know what I know now, what I would advise my 21-year-old self. And in general, uh, what I did real well is I, I did kind of the, uh, the, the liberal arts um, decade of the 20s. Um, there's a book called The Defining Decade. The, uh, the talk is not as good as the book. It's a quick read. Um, but I just did stuff. It's kind of, you know, at Yale, um, liberal arts universities have this bias to shop everything and don't get demand specific too fast. And you know, I kind of shopped everything. This is because for a while I um, paid my bills by being a commercial fisherman. And uh, you know, I was probably too stupid to know, but this is why uh, 18 to 25 year olds fight wars, uh, because they are fearless and feel invulnerable. And then a pattern of achievement. To me, the most important thing in, in any resume is uh, that most of the stuff that somebody tried, uh, there is a pattern, if not success, of uh, micro-achievement. And my sense is achievers all keep metrics. So I use the term fitness function. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, if you care about success, you should know what the, uh, what the fitness function or the metrics of success are. What I didn't do well is I was basically a jerk to uh, people in authority. Um, it was probably a father issue. Um, but so I have never had a, um, a superior officer as a mentor. I chafe under, um, under taking orders. And uh, in fact, what I've discovered is um, all people in their 20s waste a year. And they waste for lack of context. And uh, so what a mentor can do is say, don't move to Florida or um, don't date that guy. Or don't take that high-priced job that you don't like. And, um, you know, to some degree, life is like chess. You know, my, I'm not a chess player. My sense of chess is one bad move against an equal opponent um, uh, causes a loss. And so everything you do to avoid doing the one, the one bad move. Um, and then write down plans. So I'm a big fan of reflecting. Um, you know, psychologists would say that uh, uh, people tend to look at the past as if it was manifest destiny and forgetting the, uh, uh, the variability or the infinite, the infinite universes that are possible at any point. And uh, we just kind of anchor on the past as manifest destiny. You would be shocked if you go back and read your own plans that in retrospect seem really smart. I did go back and read some of the early marketing and product plans at Electronic Arts. And it's so sophomoric. I mean, thank goodness, um, you know, kids at Yale today aren't, uh, aren't as sophomoric as I was back then as we were creating kind of one of the great brands in interactive entertainment. Uh, but, but write it down, make projection, predictions. In fact, I think if somebody wants an entrepreneur, you should write a business plan every month. Keep it in a folder and review. Um, Steven Spielberg says ideas are gifts from the gods. When he has an idea, his self-discipline is to write one page of a movie script before he goes to bed that night about that idea. Um, you can too. It's really hard. You know, it's, um, um, it's like writing a diary daily if you have a boring life. <laughs> and then um, saving stuff, it used to be really hard. 
but um, you, you know, use your own use your own data of the past um, uh, to look into the future. Writers do this. Um, writers. I once aspired to be a writer, and then I met somebody who said, "Bing, you don't understand. Writers write." <laughs> And you know you don't be a writer by thinking about it. You write for 40 or 50 hours a week, no matter what. And I would say the same thing: entrepreneurs, entrepreneur. It's just if you're an entrepreneur, you don't sit around and wait till you have that great idea. You do stuff. Okay. Uh, uh, the next thing is everybody comes out of the Yale community is a number one draft pick. You know, it's like uh, being tailback at USC. Um, you are, you know. Everybody in the Yale community is tailback at USC. The reason I use as a metaphor is people who are sports fans, they know that general managers and coaches get fired if they mismanage the number one draft picks. They also get fired if they pick the wrong ones. But it's really hard to prove that you pick the wrong one. It's easier to prove that you mismanage. And here's what you do. Quarterbacks and uh, hockey defensemen um, get made backups and uh, they, get, they get some training. Um, uh, defensive linemen and running backs are starters the first year. And uh, so you ought to have a number one draft pick plan for yourself. It turns out in the years 1960 to 1990, in the NBA and the NFL, 65% of number one draft picks, not the whole round, but just the single number one, 65% uh, made all pro at least one year. And because uh, if you're the number one draft pick of the first round, you'd expect that. 30% the Hall of Fame. So, um, you know, if you have that, it says, okay, if you're a, if you're a Yaley, you should be an all-pro in business, an all-pro is a CEO or a VP of a meaningful company, or somebody who's really rich by shuffling papers on Wall Street. Um, and, you know, Hall of Fame is, um, it's not all the way to Man of the Year on Time Magazine, but, you know, there's, you know, I, I don't actually know what Hall of Fame is in business. Um, and then I got a couple other rules on number one draft pick. The rule is seven. I found, especially with kids, ask how productive were you today? And here's the metric. A 10 is the most productive you've been in life, and that's uh, you went out partying with your friends, you get back to your room, you wrote a 30-page paper, and you studied for two exams, and you aced them both the next day, that's a 10. Um, a one is uh, you're sitting in fifth grade in some boring lecture, you're sitting in some boring lecture, you're watching the clock, kind of move really slowly like Ferris Bueller, that's a one. And then ask people, where are you today? And I found people can tell. And seven is the perfect number. If you're a, a cycling fan, seven is you're in the peloton and you're doing uh, 2,000K in 20 days. Um, a 10 is an attack going uphill. You just can't do 10s very often. And I found most people in their 20s, when they think they're doing a 10, they're breaking things and causing problems for others. They're just kind of all putting it off. So 10 is possible, but um, uh, 10 is for attack. So, you know, um, uh, Savior, uh, uh, seven is repeatable. You should be able to do seven every day. So hopefully today, if you ask yourself, how's today for me? Is today a seven? Um, you know, you still have time to make it a seven if it's not already. There's probably somebody here that if you met for the first time, um, they could turn today into a high value day for you. Um, and then the rule of 30% is a little bit weird, bear with me. Uh, think Cartesian coordinates, think a slope, and, the, and on the horizontal axis is years, and the vertical axis is career progress. Most people have a thought about, over time I'm gonna get to about here. You know, Stanford MBAs all think, um, in 10 years, I'm going to be a CEO. Harvard MBA is all thinking, two years, I'm going to be a CEO. <laughs> I guess the Harvard guy is doing the AV. <laughs> um, and uh, my, my experience is, if you're a manager, you should know the career slope aspirations for every one of your employees. And if you're an employee, you should make sure your manager know, knows yours. And you can ask, am I on track to be such and such in two years? And, um, and in my sense, there's usually a gap. We'd like people to believe they're better than their bosses think they are. But the gap should never be more than 30%. So if you think two years and they think more than three years, it's time to start looking for a job. If you start looking for a job, 
Um, you know, in, in all entrepreneurship, including yourself, you need to circle a date on the calendar and say, if I don't reach this milestone by, by this date, um, I'm going to shut it down and do something else. Um, my sense is a VP needs to give the company a year, a director about six months, everybody else no more than three months. Is there any chance we can get a light here? You want me to uh, press the button in the bottom? Oh, and by the way, that's Wayne Gretzky. You look at him and you go, I know he's going to be the best hockey player of all yes. time. And he's going to marry some beautiful actress. And then he's going to he's going to win the Olympics and win Canada's honor back. You look at him and go, um, no. <laughs> OK, um, how to pick your first job. This is probably not that meaningful to any of you anymore. But um, if you're pay it forward people, which many Yale people are, others are going to ask you. You probably know high school kids and eight year olds. Um, so here's my advice. Uh, when in doubt, pick an industry that has more jobs than people. And the reason is, uh, when people are treated like valuable commodities, they're nicer to each other. You know, if you go into showbiz, it's, it's going into showbiz is a little like uh, trying to major in pre-med or economics. You know, in college, those departments try to convince people in the first class, don't major in my major. There's too many of us, and it's not that great anyway. Um, so anyway, that's one. Um, the next thing, the Yale experience, shopping a professor, shop a boss. I think one bit of advice I heard from Jeff Brenzel, a dean at Yale, is don't take classes for content, take it for the prof. And by the way, I think the same thing about going on uh, African safaris. The country you go to doesn't matter, the guide is everything. Um, and then you can look to see if it's a meritocracy system, system or a seniority system. Um, in general, the key, um, uh, the, the number one signal that is a meritocracy is there's somebody under 25 in the executive suite. Um, in general, I, I think uh, I've found that 35 year olds are the enemy of innovation. Just, just think at 35, you got house payments, you probably are starting to have kids. You've worked hard to get where you are, and the last thing you want to do is screw it up. And, uh, but if you're, if you're the boss of a 35-year-old, you want everybody to maximize their expected value. You can play a portfolio, but to play a portfolio of 35-year-olds, you got to have each of them maximize expected outcome, not minimize possibility of failure. I can explain it in more math if you'd like, but I think I'll just keep going on. And then um, uh, finally, write your doers, doers profile, and that is not a resume, but what are you good at? What do you like to do all day? What would your friends say about you? And then match that of a friend who ran uh, uh, sales in the Sims uh, Electronic Arts. And she said, um, she had an eighth grade teacher in eighth grade said, what do you like to do all day? And young Nancy wrote down, I like to be with people, I like to travel, I like every day to be different than the next. And as she was packing up to move from uh, uh, Laguna Beach to Chicago to be a court reporter, and you know, those are the people that just sit and type, can't talk all day, and have to be invisible. And this thing fell out of her uh, hope chest, and she looked at it and her heart sank. She said, I have lost myself. And a year later, she was uh, moved to a, a sales career and became a Hall of Famer. So, um, have your doer's profile early and you know staple it to the refrigerator. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, lifelong learning. Um, in general, to be a life, the first signal that you're not a lifelong learner is you take feedback with your arms crossed. And you know this is a normal body posture for women. I think it's it's, it's comfortable, and probably more comfortable uh, than men. Um, but you know, force yourself when you uh, when you're getting notes um, to open up, and don't you know don't say don't say no. And then um, I have a list that's a little longer than this, but I tell people who wonder should I get an MBA? There's only three reasons to get an MBA. Uh, the first reason is you're in a career where MBA is required, and that's um, Asian uh, top industries, uh, consulting. And it used to be banking, but anymore it's not. So there are not very many businesses where an MBA actually is required to step ahead. And the opportunity cost of getting an MBA is about 250 grand. 
So it's pretty expensive. So the, the second reason to get an MBA, which was my reason, is it's a get out of jail card. Um, you're stuck in an industry and you need to whitewash your personal positioning. Um, I was an unemployable commercial fisherman. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I, came, I went to Stanford and I was still kind of a semi-unemployable commercial fisherman, but at least I got interviews. Um, and the third reason is um, it's, a, it's a really great vacation and you can afford it. It's, the MBA business school is not as intellectually demanding as, uh, as a Yale undergraduate, um, unless you're on a PhD track. And um, anybody who hasn't done it, um, I, Brad Stone who wrote The Everything Store, I'd advised him to write each chapter starting with a shareholder letter and instead he made up a fiction that uh, the initiative is at Amazon, we're all predetermined and we're separable. Um, but uh, uh, Bezos, Bezos is up there with uh, Warren Buffett in his letter. So Warren Buffett's the other writer. Um, I'm a fan of uh, trying to see how people fast track from about 18 to 30. Um, so there's a concept in Hollywood called elements. And an element is someone who, when attached to a project, makes the project bankable. It can be a writer, it can be a director, it can be a movie star. Um, it's very rarely something other. It can be a book property. So, you know, your, your job is to become an element as soon as possible. So I went out and I found all the people at Electronic Arts who were elements by age 29. And then I went to the people who promoted them along the way and asked why. And surprisingly enough, uh, the people who have influence on your career um, do not have very crisp thinking. And here's what it came down to. They would say, everything I asked them to do, they, they completed. Um, that's, like, that's like, you know, it's like kind of all girls in school. They did all their homework, um, and they did it well, and some boys. Um, but the, ne the next thing is, I don't know, they just always ask the best questions. They always got them thinking. And uh, everybody from Yale should be able to ask the best questions in the room. Not in a smarmy way, but the best questions in the room. And then finally, they're always brimming with new ideas. You know, the way that, uh, the way that people get bet on is, well, we got a problem. I need somebody to do this. Well, Jake's got good ideas. Maybe I can get him to do something so he doesn't go off and start a company and be worthless to my company. Um, then there's this the notion of a career chasm. And um, um, in general, high potential young people are incompetent in groups. You know, you think about it, um, no young people are trained in groups of bigger than about three. You know, universities organize around study carols. Um, if you were a player coach, you could be at, at Yale. You know, a lot of the activities you can get to be a leader there. There's a lot of opportunities for leaders in junior year. Uh, but, but you know, most people are better off being a guild, guild manager in World of Warcraft um, than going to college and they want to lead. Um, and then the next thing that happens is when you get a job, you are hazed in a career as you are hazed in a society at Yale. And, um, and your boss is usually a bad boss, um, the first or second boss, and they want you to focus on tunnel vision, on task. And then at some point they go, whoa, this person's going to be promoted. And then you expect to go from task to big picture. And it's almost impossible unless you've been looking at big picture along the way. So it's actually one of the best things about a liberal arts degree, if you uh, take advantage of it, is you've got a lot of compare and contrast. You have what uh, Theodore Levitt calls a marketing imagination. Um, from task to ownership, again, is from uh, um, do this right now. It's kind of the blue collar aspects of white collar to take an area of responsibility. And um, um, do what you're told to um, 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 excite and motivate other people. My experience is it's really hard to predict as an employer who's going to cross this chasm. And uh, one prediction of being a leader is there's always people hanging out around their desk. Um, another is kind of in their personal life, they're always leading and stuff. Um, it, it's really hard. And, and I. You know, I'm probably wrong 30% of the time on that. 
Um, um, learning managing is also really hard. And uh, um, you think about managing, the best metaphor is sports coach. You know, a sports coach's job is to get two or three more wins per season out of the same group of players. And, um, you, you know, if you talk to sports coaches, how they do it, it's a little bit of strategy. It's a lot of motivation. What I found in getting interested in sports analytics, coaches don't care about analytics. General managers care about analytics. Coaches care about motivation. And they fine tune their motivation to every single player. So back to the, the 30%, if you know that this player wants to be all pro and will work harder than Jerry Rice, you know, you want to you want to build that. If you know this guy's just trying to make money and doesn't care even if the team wins, you got to do something else. Um, my experience is people who are not natural managers. Um, the the uh, the best approach is to try to be a great teacher. I think teaching uh, can be learned. Managing, um, there, there's no great ways to learn how to be a manager, um, except for being a parent. The interesting thing about the job of parenting is. Um, uh, most people are amateurs. They don't do it very often. You'd never go to a doctor to get heart surgery with someone as inexperienced as we all are as parents when we become parents. Um, it's, uh, it's extremely humbling, um, especially if uh, your kids are in a family with more jobs than people. And then finally, I find for uh, people with high aspirations, it's always useful in any problem situation to say, if you were the person that you wanted to be, how would you perform right here? So hopefully you've all had at least one awful boss. Um, and if you've written down, if this person would only be like this, that would be better. And then don't be that awful boss. And uh, I believe in interactivity. So a way to check that you're not the awful boss is to start a conversation with people you work with. Am I your awesome boss? Am I, or am I your awful boss? I just saw a guy named Alex Gardner who showed up at Zynga this week as president of studios, and he sat down with uh, 50 uh, leaders and said, I work for you. Um, here's my cell phone number. It's going to be available to every employee in the company. Um, at Microsoft, 120,000 people had my, uh, my, phone, my cell phone number. And my SLA on email response is 24 hours. And if I don't achieve that, hold me to it. What do you think would happen if at universities the SLA on homework uh, assignment grading and response is 24 hours? People would play less World of Warcraft. Okay, CEO 2.0. I assert that the job of CEO is changing. Just as the job in sports, you know, Vince Lombardi used to be an authority figure. We're starting to see coaches in their 30s who are more peers. Um, so what I've noticed with people, every time they become a CEO, they raise their hiring standards. So um, uh, your job as a CEO is to get to your perfect team as fast as possible. The President of the United States is the best example. The day they're inaugurated, they have this slate of their perfect team all, all nominated. Um, my experience is first time CEOs tend to take uh, two plus years to get the perfect team together. Second time about one year. And third time CEOs um, break rules to get, get the perfect team assembled in three months. I'll beat the clock in a sense. All great teams that I've been experienced with, your goal is two calendar weeks of work every week. If you're in the Moore's Law business, you have to beat the clock. Um, so agility, modularity, and great people helps. Teams that are doing one week of progress per, per two calendar weeks all die. If somebody's saying, yeah, we're not going to ship it till it's time, they're still doing stuff internally. Um, be the customer, you would be shocked at two things. One is most people, most first-time entrepreneurs um, tend to stop doing the thing that got them there. So if you get promoted in a bigger role, don't stop doing what you used to do. Uh, do and. And then be the customer. You'd be shocked at how many missionary companies, how many people are in missionary companies who don't have a single friend that they've convinced to use the product and that they stay in touch with. So you can actually count. You know, if you don't have 90% of your employees being missionary to at least one customer, uh, you're not doing your job. And then finally, um, um, you know, I have a friend in marketing that says brand is the only valuable thing in marketing. I think in business leadership, culture is the most valuable thing. And um, it's just shocking how soon it can go bad. 
And then as a, um, if you are ever presenting to investors, you should know when you walk out of the room, they never say, wow, what a business plan. It's always, do you like her or not? Did she blow you away? Is she great? Um, because uh, great entrepreneurs always find a way um, uh, to return, and business plans uh, rarely do. Uh, next is, does this leader have scalable skills? So do they have a vision that when they have to talk to 100 people will work? Do they understand the tech stack so this thing can get bigger and bigger? And then finally, just as with a college application, all the pieces of the application have to tell one story. Uh, do the numbers tell the same story as the picture? And then um, in Yale, it's great to see, you know, this is the beachhead. So Yale people are the best synthesizers and team builders of any selective university um, probably in the world. See it again and again and again. Um, Yaleys are not very good at being assholes. You know, that's why there's, there's more entrepreneurs come out of Harvard. You know, it's um, <laughs> Harvard does a really good job of making their undergraduates, you know, un uncomfortable. I mean, it's an awful experience. The teachers hate the kids. And, uh, really, I'm saying in classes, they hate the kids. Um, and then um, uh, what Yaleys don't do so well is get from books to pragmatism and from words to numbers and comp sci. Um, so, you know, you heard Brad and Jake talk about there's ways to be an adult learner of comp sci and, you know, the way to be pragmatic is uh, uh, to try stuff with people who went to community college. Um, it's interesting to see Rick Levin and Coursera now salivate leading hard in innovation. I mean, Yale gets it that New Haven um, just can't be uh, the new Oxford. And then a network, you know, it's... Um, uh, pay it horizontally, but also, you know, let's be kind to the next generation coming behind us and let's work a little harder to give them, uh, give them a beachhead. And, um, oh, and, you know, if you, I've, I've uh, published some stuff on kpc.com. We've got councils of 80 design leads and product leads and companies that get together half portfolio, half out. That's kind of cool. Um, I tweet a little bit. Um, and that's my email. And I answer email, but not necessarily in 24 hours unless you're a student. And this is um, the first KPCB <coughs> design fellow group, and there's a couple of Yaleys in it, which made me really proud. Um, so that's the end of the minimum viable preso. Um, is anybody delighted to ask a question or get a clarification or make a comment? No? Okay. Oh, yeah. Do it in the white shirt. You always answer questions from people in white shirts because they're going to run an investment bank someday. <laughs> So it's, it's data versus people. I think more broadly it's data versus design. But I actually think that um, if you're a fan of behavioral psychology, um, you know, psychology is moving from uh, Freud to numbers and um, eraser of Freud to Skinner. Um, and I, I think for any of you who haven't looked at it, look at um, OkCupid. Okay it's a dating site that publishes their analytics. All the funnel and retention data and attraction data on OkCupid okay looks a lot like any kind of uh, mobile app. So, you know, media, uh, seeing a customer hitting your landing page, your app page for the first time, is a lot like walking into a restaurant for a blind date. You know, if you lose the first five seconds, your history. Um, so, to me, the issue about design uh, versus quant, uh, that designers can imagine what to test and then can do design rhetoric uh, to make stuff more interesting. Now, if you know that um, it's possible for a label to, to increase sales and touchability by 50%, it's probably not more than 50%. Although I did see on, uh, on uh, old style beer, a 3X on an offshoot of beer can. Instantly, change the can, no advertising, 3X sales. 
So if you know that, now you go to your designer and say, okay, try like crazy the possibilities for 3X. Um, and then you can kind of test along the way. I think designers tend to imagine what to test um, and then uh, quants can measure the test. The negative of quants is um, numbers people tend to overvalue uh, short-term provable and undervalue long-term. And it's, it's easy to figure out why that if you run a test that takes you know, a year, uh, you don't get the claim results for a year. And so you're uneasy for a long time. So in this day and age, product management makes the mistake of kind of the local maximum mistake of overvaluing the stuff that's provable in an hour a day. And um, so I, I think I'd do both. I would try to keep the, uh, the quant stream going and the intuition stream and the people stream. And I think in your lifetime, you're going to see that uh, uh, most interpersonal behaviors are uh, going to be quantifiable with science. You know, we're going to do it with heart rate monitors and um, you know, lie detectors and skin galvanometers and you have brain scans. Yes? How did uh, technology change organizational design? Or how should, how should technology change organizational design? I think organizational design uh, architecture should match the architecture of, uh, of computer programs. There's a stack and it's also modularity. And uh, the modular design the hardest job is the architect job. So CEO is an architect. Um, so if you want to give meaning to people, um, you want them to be to be close to uh, to outcomes. And so you, you, you build people in modules. Jeff Bezos calls them two pizza teams. But it turns out it's really hard when you when you do modular code. And the reason most code architectures don't become modular to the second generation, it's really hard to predefine the I/O. And uh, Bezos also says two pizza teams that, that everybody on the team's calendar should be, 90% of their hours should be just within the team, no more than 10% I.O. Because as um, computer scientists know, I.O. is the killer of performance. So the problem isn't meetings, the problem is uh, too much time in I.O. Okay, and the question is reflection, regret, happening for a reason. Um, the, I would say first about reflection. I mean, I think regret is just a signal that you should pay attention to reflecting on that. And then it can be, it, it, it can be dehumanizing. You know, it's really clear that, uh, uh, that confidence makes people better, it makes them more creative, it makes them uh, more valuable to people around them. Uh, so in general, Yale people, you know, um, um, uh, use your inner Yale. It's, you know, you, you got to enter every room with a smile. And not every room with I'm smarter than you, which comes from some other schools. Um, and then the, um, it's really hard to, to find useful data. And I think regret is a signal that maybe there's some data there. I was saying to somebody yesterday, most people who are successful misunderstand what got them there. If you read the book, Built the Last, what they would say is, uh, what, he, what Colin says is, what he, as nearly as he could tell, the actual value system that a company has, has no signaling effect for success. The commitment to the value system and the alignment of the value system is highly correlated with success. So um, uh, most people who say, this is why I'm successful, are wrong. You know, in fact, um, for guys in business, um, the number one reason to be success for success is your height. And, you know, have you ever heard anybody say, you know, John Don Odebe say, you know, my success is my height. You might, you know, you might have heard, uh, you wouldn't even hear Shaq say that. It says, my success, my ability to dance. And, uh, but it's kind of, it's, it's an unfair advantage. Ener life energy is an unfair advantage. <laughs> well, you know, you have to do it the old-fashioned way, by being better than people around you. Um, you know, it, it, um, I mean, a short is great for motivation, especially for men. You know, look at it, you know, look at it today. Um, <laughs> the bullying. Um, but, you know, so 
So if, if somebody in the news went successful, I would uh, be skeptical. But most people don't know. Um, you know, ask your loved ones uh, why. You know, why am I so good? I recently asked my daughter. Somebody asked, "What's your secret to parenting?" And I said, "We were home for dinner every night, and we did this. And we focused on education." And one daughter said, "Yeah, she kind of bought into that." And the other daughter, who's a little bit older and wiser, said, "No, no, you just liked us." And I've never thought of that in a million years. And you know, so she she came up simple. Um, uh, we're going to wrap because the guy holding the number thing is giving me <laughs> such a stink face, you can't believe it. <laughs> well, let's give a round of applause for him.